What's taking so long with the Elite Series 3? Is the Xbox Series X going up in price? Just a reminder, if you take a look down at the description below, I have links for all sorts of Xbox gear. I've been talking a lot about the Ultimate Wired Xbox Controller by 8-Bit Do. That's down there as well. You can buy it through Best Buy. If you want to get in on this new generation of Xbox Cloud Gaming, I also have some links for some Samsung TVs that support the Xbox Game Pass app that they're coming out with. How's it going, everyone? And welcome to Xbox Ready. I obviously I'm not Ray. Uh, he is feeling under the weather. He's working on a big video at home. So I offered to jump in here on the weekly Xbox weekend roundup. And this week we're starting out with exclusives because Phil Spencer just did an interview with Bloomberg where he essentially said that exclusives are going the way of the dinosaur in the industry and that we'll be seeing less and less of them as time goes on. And what I'm assuming is that he's talking about Microsoft's strategy of getting the Xbox ecosystem on as many devices as possible, right? Like you can log into your Xbox account if you buy the games on Steam, you can log into your Xbox account on your phone. Basically what it seems like he wants Xbox to be in the future is a platform that's in the cloud, right? Like where you can log into your Xbox account, you can access all of these different games that are on Game Pass. And on top of that, you're going to be able to access the games you own on your Xbox account from the cloud as well. So you can play them on your phone, you can play them on your Steam Deck, you can play them on your PC, and you can just play them anywhere you want. Because if you have all of these huge franchises, right? Like Halo, Forza, Doom, Gears of War, Fallout, uh, the Elder Scrolls, just so many different types of franchises and you have them underneath the Xbox umbrella and you figure out a way to tell PlayStation fans, hey, all you have to do to play these games is make an Xbox account and subscribe to Game Pass. That's just like the biggest win of all time for Microsoft because they've got people playing their games and giving them money on different devices. And I bet they'd be happy to make an agreement with Sony that says, yeah, we'll give you 30% of the revenue we make on the PlayStation Store from Game Pass subscriptions. I can see what he's saying. I just don't personally like it. The reason I like exclusives over on the PlayStation side of the fence is that they're really like showcase pieces. They're like touchstone points of where the industry is at for other developers to look at and say, oh, these are the features that people want in games. And this is how you make a really high quality game with all of those features in it. And having these first party games that are just straight up exclusives that have huge budget that we're paying $70 for basically is a wall between these games and microtransactions and battle passes and season passes and all of these different ways to spend money on these products. For the most part, with the Sony game, unless you're buying a collector's edition or a DLC pack down the line, you're paying 60 or 70 bucks up front and that is all you ever have to spend on the game. Whereas with this Game Pass model, even with something like Halo Infinite, right? You get the campaign on Game Pass, but the way they supplement that huge budget that they put towards Halo Infinite's development, which took over five years, is to make the multiplayer free to play with battle passes and cosmetics in the store and all of that extra stuff you can just spend your money on. Sony is of course not immune to this in any way. They literally just bought Bungie who makes Destiny 2, which also has the seasonal model. They do yearly expansions. They have an annual pass that gives you dungeons. They've got skins you can buy in the store. That's obviously Sony's big downfall with these live service games. And they also have a a huge investment into Epic Games, who basically has the greediest game of all time in Fortnite. And of course, for every game on Game Pass like Halo Infinite that has these mobile game inspired elements, there are tons of single player games that don't have any microtransactions, like Psychonauts 2, for example, or the upcoming Hellblade 2, that are great and make the Game Pass subscription worth it. And honestly, I see the utility in getting to a point where Microsoft and Sony are doing sort of different things and can differentiate themselves. So if we've got Nintendo who really focuses on first party games and those experiences. We've got Sony who's also doing kind of a similar thing but in the hardcore more mature space and then we have Microsoft who's just trying to get as many games into as many households on as many devices as possible. They're all doing their own thing and I think that's cool. Next up let's talk about Jeff Keighley's opening night live event at Gamescom because in my opinion it was really cool. We of course got a bunch of new gameplay from the Callisto Protocol. My favorite part was when the guy used stasis to throw an enemy into that
that turbine that he got sucked into at the last Jeff Keighley event, it was like, yeah, I got sucked into it last time, but now you're going into it and it's not gonna feel very good. I can tell you from experience. Another game that obviously stood out to me is Killer Clowns from Outer Space the Game. It's another asymmetrical multiplayer horror game. So if you've played Friday the 13th, Dead by Daylight, or Evil Dead the Game, you kind of get the gist of what's going on here. A few people are playing as the Killer Clowns and a few people are playing as survivors. I'm not sure if you'll be able to fight back against the clowns in this one, but for me personally, that makes or breaks the game and decides whether or not I'll play it. Dying Light 2 is getting its first big expansion, which is called Bloody Ties. I'm personally really excited for this. I've been digging into Dying Light 2 over the past few weeks, and I think it's one of the better AAA games to come out this year. Interestingly, the sequel to Techland's first big zombie game, Dead Island, Dead Island 2, was shown off for the first time in, I think, nine years, and it looked pretty good. You get to, like, explore LA, and I wasn't super excited about it just because of this game's history, but when the developers started talking about how instead of it being, like, like the Walking Dead where, oh, humans are the real enemy. We don't even have to be scared of zombies. This time they're going and making the zombies the actual villain in the game. That's what initially made me go, hmm, I think I might check this out. And then the big standout game for everyone was Lies of P, which I'm pretty sure is coming to Game Pass day one. This is a game that's like if you took Bloodborne and then put Timothy Chalamet in it and he's playing Pinocchio. All the monsters look like dolls. The world looks like Victorian and all messed up. It's basically right up my alley down to the health bars that look like they're straight from a Souls game. So if you had a PS4 last generation and you love Bloodborne and you've been missing out on games like that, this looks like one to pay attention to. So yeah, I don't know what people are talking about. Gamescom was awesome this year. One move I'm glad Microsoft is not stealing from Sony though is increasing the price of their consoles. Honestly, I gotta praise Microsoft here. The Series S, that thing came out of the gate costing $300 and we've already seen it drop as low as $250 and it comes along with extra skins for Fortnite and stuff like that, I'm pretty sure. So for a lot of people, I think that's a great entry point into the world of next-gen gaming, especially when you can't find a Series X or a PS5, especially also considering there really aren't that many games that are taking advantage of either truly next-gen console just yet. But over on the Sony side of the fence, we just heard overnight that across the world, like in every country basically that the PS5 is sold, except for the United States, the PS5 is going up in price of around $30 to $50 US equivalent based on where you're at, which I don't really like at all, obviously. I already think these consoles are pretty expensive at $500, so raising the price to around 560, which previously in the UK specifically, Sony was selling a PS5 with Horizon Forbidden West bundled in for 50 pounds more. So considering that, it's gonna be 50 pounds even more on top of that. So considering that, I'd assume that they're going to raise the price of that bundle, which is really the only way to buy a PS5 in the UK right now as well, which will bring the price to over 500 pounds, which doing that conversion is like 600 bucks. That's crazy. So the smart guy that he is, Jez Corden from Windows Central, went and asked Microsoft, he was like, hey, is the price gonna go up on the Series X in the UK at least? And they said, no, not right now. The prices are going to stay exactly the same on our consoles. And really, that's not surprising. I mean, Sony can definitely afford this too, but if you look at the difference between like Microsoft's market cap and Sony's market cap, it's not even a competition. Microsoft has way, way, way more money in the bank. So even with inflation, they can afford to keep the Xbox Series X at the exact same price it is now and just take the hit on the lost revenue on the console because they know that all their money's coming from Game Pass, digital game purchases, and to some extent, even disc-based game purchases. Whereas Sony, they have a smaller market cap, they're blaming inflation, they're saying, look, we wanna make a profit on the PS5 this generation, or at the very least, break even. And where we're at right now, based on inflation, basically makes it so that we're losing money on every console. And personally, I have no sympathy for them. That's like tough luck, in my opinion. Yeah, it sucks that you're having a tough time getting your PS5 into people's hands. It just feels extra predatory when people still can't fight scalpers and get a PS5, you're making the console even more expensive. It's just like cutting people down at the knees when they're already taking the hit of not being able to find a console and also everything is more expensive these days as well. So with all that being said, it's good to know that Microsoft is reading the room and not raising the price of the Xbox Series X because you know, people should be able to afford to buy video game consoles. Now we 
have to talk about the Elite Series 3. This thing has come up in the news a lot over the past few weeks because we initially heard that we would hear news about it by the end of this year, but then uh, a white version of the Elite Series 2 leaked, and now we're hearing that the thing has been internally delayed and we're not going to even see it until 2023. But I personally think Microsoft needs to get on this sooner rather than later because Sony just announced the DualSense Edge. And to be fair, when you take the Elite Series 2 and you compare it to a lot of the features that are in the DualSense Edge, it's pretty much an identical controller. Of course, the only difference is being that you can actually change the whole thumbstick module on the DualSense Edge, and also you're getting built-in DualSense features like the adaptive triggers and the better haptics. But that's not really a fair comparison, in my opinion, just because that's just taking the internals of the regular controller and putting it in the Pro Controller and calling it a feature. But I think it's fair to say that Sony has a better reputation when it comes to quality control of their controllers, and specifically when you're talking about the Elite Series 2. That thing has been a quality control nightmare from the very beginning. I mean, this goes back to the Elite Series 1. The rubber kind of degrades over time that they were using. The buttons get a little less sticky, like the magnets on the thumbsticks, especially in the Elite Series 2. They lose their magnetism over time. A lot of people have had issues with the B button specifically sticking on both controllers, and the rubber issue I just mentioned is not really an issue on the Elite Series 2, but then the triggers start breaking down, and the little tabs you use to use the trigger locks, those just fall off after a little while, which all is to say the quality control is not great on the Series 2. So while apples to apples comparison, the DualSense Edge is very similar to the Elite Series 2 down to the carrying case you can charge the controller through, uh, I think they need to get a new controller out before the DualSense Edge to make people want to buy it. Because Sony has been doing a really good job making sure that their controllers and their games are coming to PC. So if I personally have the option between the DualSense Edge, knowing that it works with all my Steam games, and the Elite Series 2, knowing that it also works with all my Steam games, I'm gonna go with the DualSense Edge because I personally have already gone through two Elite Series 2 and I am not spending $180 on another one. So if they were able to get this thing out before the DualSense Edge, I would probably pick it up even though I've been burned with two other controllers in the past, just because I love the utility of being able to leave my Elite controller connected to Bluetooth on my PC and connected to the Xbox radio that's in my Xbox Series X. Nothing you can do on the DualSense sense can beat that feature of being able to switch back and forth seamlessly without having to get up off my couch, walk across the room, and connect my DualSense to my PS5 to reconnect it after I use it on my PC. And now we got to talk about everyone's favorite delayed game, Hogwarts Legacy. And I sympathize with the Xbox fans out there because this game's being marketed to Kingdom Come by Sony. It's also getting an exclusive quest on the PlayStation 5, including some other bonuses. But where you are not losing out is with the insanely cool collector's edition. So the price of this thing is extremely hefty at $300, but what comes along with it is honestly pretty cool. On the digital side, you get some in-game bonuses. That's whatever. I don't really care about that. You also get 72 hours of early access, which effectively makes the release date three days earlier. That's kind of cool. But the best feature of all is a book. It's like a big Harry Potter style old book that when opened allows you to place a wand that I'm assuming is the one from the game on the book, but it floats in the air above it. It's kind of a cool effect. I'd love to see this on video because I've actually seen stuff like this before. So if you take that cost of Hogwarts Legacy, which is $70 and cut it off the price of the $300 collector's edition, you've got to decide if this floating wand setup is worth $230. Now as someone who spends a huge chunk of their income on Destiny 2 and is really eyeing the collector's edition of Lightfall, I am not going to yuck anyone's yum and tell them not to buy this collector's edition of Hogwarts Legacy because who am I to say? Just in my opinion, 300 bucks is a little expensive, but the gimmick is cool. And if you compare it to the prices of stuff at Universal Studios in the Harry Potter zone, uh, it looks pretty damn cheap.